Welcome back. Let's Get Physical Therapy is an educational podcast brought to you by MedStar Health and hosted by me, physical therapist Becca Schumer. I will be sharing the mic with tons of healthcare professionals with the goal of educating and inspiring fellow PTs and future PTs. We hope you find this both informative and inspirational, ultimately optimizing how we treat our patients and grow as professionals. Please enjoy today's episode. We are finishing up our series on baseball medicine with biomechanist Joey Mylot today. Joey played Division Three baseball at Rochester Institute of Technology, where he received his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering. Joey then went on to complete his master's degree in biomedical engineering at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. He also worked and conducted research in the Wake Forest Pitching Lab during his graduate studies. Joey also served as a graduate assistant and a member of the baseball analytics team with the Demon Deacon baseball team. Joey works for the Baltimore Orioles in their player development department as their biomechanist, where he works with both pitchers and hitters. I really enjoyed my conversation with Joey today. I appreciate how he discussed the importance of the collaboration between providers in order to optimize how pitchers pitch and hitters hit. So let's dig into it. Hey, Joey, welcome to the podcast. How's it going? I'm great. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing well. I'm so excited that you're here. I know that you're a busy man, so... I'm grateful for you for spending some time with us so you can drop some knowledge bombs on us about baseball. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited too. Sweet. So we like to talk about your career. How did you become a biomechanist for the O's and what did your career leading up to that look like? Yeah, so I kind of started in college um, during my own playing career. So I ended up, I went to Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York, played Division Three baseball there. And I was doing biomedical engineering as my undergrad, and I really kind of kind of dove into baseball player development, um, kind of as it was taking off and getting big, just kind of around the country, uh, kind of looking at ways to make myself better as a player, um, and got super interested in and really tied it into my major. I figured I could do something in that in that realm uh, since I was doing engineering already. Um, and got super interested in biomechanics that way. And then from there, after RIT, I went to Wake Forest, uh, where I got my master's in biomedical engineering there, uh, focused on biomechanics. And I worked and researched in the Wake Forest Pitching Lab there. That's where I got my exposure to motion capture um, and really kind of dove into biomechanics completely there and focused on biomechanics research in the pitching lab, did my research, uh, my master's thesis there and worked with the team. So I was able to kind of do different types of things, whether it was like medical injury risk reduction research, as well as kind of player development performance based research. So got a little bit of taste of both at Wake Forest. And then from there, uh, I was hired by the Orioles and now I'm working uh, in the Orioles player de development department. <laughs> Sounds like a really nice, smooth, natural progression of a career, but I imagine it couldn't have been that easy. What was the challenge in getting to where you are? Were there hiccups? Did you have to like shadow a bunch? How did you get into where you are now? Because I feel like that's a goal of a lot of people to work for a professional team. Yeah, so I honestly kind of figured this out, this kind of path out a little bit later in my undergraduate career. Um, I was looking in a different kind of area of biomedical engineering. Um early on in my career and then kind of decided to shift to this biomechanics route. So from there, it was really researching graduate schools and really trying to figure out where I can get really good hands-on experience because I didn't have any of that experience coming out of undergrad. Um, so deciding where to go, um, figuring out like different types of labs and different places um, at different schools. Uh, there's, there's a ton of great options around the country um, for these different types of labs. There's, there's a ton of different places doing biomechanics, uh, specifically in baseball. Um, I ended up choosing Wake Forest and had a great fit there. But yeah, it was definitely a big, a um, lot of shadowing early on, trying to figure out the system, trying to figure out um, different ways to look at the data, interpret it, and kind of how it all ties back to performance on the field. And then as well as like being efficient in their delivery and um, making sure that we can have these guys stay on the field and stay healthy as well. You mentioned the injury risk reduction, but I also know you do a lot with collaborating with PTs and athletic trainers and probably strength coaches, and there's a performance enhancement piece. So what does your a typical day for you look like? 
a typical day for me is um I, I don't know if there is a typical day for me but um yeah so i do a lot of different uh collaboration with our conditioning coaches our pitching coaches our athletic trainers pts um really kind of just get the entire picture on the athlete and try to develop them from all different angles and really kind of just keep everything moving in the same direction so we don't have people um, kind of pulling in different directions, really try to streamline their player development. And um, yeah, the the main goal is to keep these guys healthy um, and get them performing at their best. So the context and collaboration from the PT side of things, from the strength and conditioning side of things, really adds a ton of value and a ton of context um, into how I'm looking at the biomechanics report, what their physical uh, limitations and their movement patterns that they excel at uh, are really, really beneficial in, in giving me context to how I'm looking at their delivery um, on the biomech report. What might that look like? Will the physical therapist see the athlete first? Do you see them first? How do you combine what you find and what they find in order to provide a program or create a program for the athlete? Yeah, so typically um, we're going to have the athlete go through their uh, functional movement screen and physical therapy screen first. Um, just kind of see how the athlete uh, moves naturally, getting those on the table measurements uh, for range of motion, um, strength testing, um, upper extremity, lower extremity, uh, yeah, functional movement uh, assessment, how they're able to to move, whether it's in a single leg squat um, or postural assessment, things like that. So we're going to do that first uh, before the athlete starts really warming up, um, just to see how their body kind of naturally moves. And then let them kind of progress through a typical warm up, whatever they're going to typically do on a, let's say it's a starting pitcher, whatever they would normally do on their start day. So I'm going to let the athlete kind of go through their full routine and get them um, ready to go up to as close to game intensity as possible um, is kind of our ideal scenario. The screening that you are collaborating with at the Beller office with the pitching tunnel is the screening different whether you have a high school pitcher up to a professional pitcher? Does it look the same or are there different things you're looking at? Uh, the screen is going to be the same. We're going to be looking at the same um, different types of tests, um, looking through them. We might go into a little bit more detail um, on certain tests where we see where a physical therapist might see a deficiency, um, but that's kind of at the uh, f physical therapist discretion, but I mean, really that could happen with any athlete. You see a high school kid or a professional guy where there, you might see something a little bit off on their screen. You might want to kind of dive into a little bit more. Um, so that's, that can definitely be done, um, and is done on a case by case basis, but really it's, um, that same screen across age levels. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty, pretty comprehensive screen that, uh, that our PTs have developed. I I've heard and seen it. It is very thorough. Yeah. But that's a, that's a good thing. You want it to be. Yeah, it's thorough, but I'm I'm pretty impressed with how how like smooth it runs and it doesn't it's thorough, but it doesn't take an hour to get through this screen. It's really only 15 minutes, which is which is a big, big props to our PTs here. Mm -hmm. You want to cover all the bases. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Nice. What are some common deviations that you're looking for with pitching mechanics in order to assess risk of injury? Yeah, so I mean a big one. Uh, would be looking at the arm action, how that arm is working, um, seeing what kind of positions that arm is getting into. But really a lot of it is gonna stem from what positions the athlete is getting into prior to their arm action working and how they're kind of setting up their delivery. Going to kind of line up the dominoes or not line them up, I guess, for how they kind of start the delivery and their move down the mound before they kind of get their arm up and going. But I guess kind of big ones that are going to be um, increasing forces and torques uh, that we're seeing on our biomech report on the arm are going to be that arm kind of being flat at foot plant, uh, that arm not being like flipped up and externally rotated. Uh, we call that kind of call that their arm flipping up late. Um, that is one that kind of causes the arm to rush through and not have as much time to work through external rotation and layback um, prior to ball release. Uh, another big one would be our elbow flexion angle. Uh, if we have guys getting outside of 90 degrees early, kind of casting that uh, forearm out. Uh, a lot of pitching coaches call it forearm fly out. Um, seeing that arm get outside of that elbow flexion get outside of 90 degrees. Some kind of big ones in the arm action that are going to be um, increasing 
uh, injury risk and forces and torques on the arm. What are some other ones that, are, that can affect fastball velocity in the upper extremity? In the upper extremity, uh, rotational speeds are going to be your friend. If you're trying to produce velocity, the faster you're rotating, um, the uh, ideally the faster the ball is going to be coming out. Um, but a lot of uh, a lot of predictors of fastball velocity are outside of the arm as well. Uh, it's a full body motion, very uh, complex delivery with everything kind of getting dynamically working together. Um, so uh, hip shoulder separation uh, is another big one. And a lot of this is uh, researched uh, and has been researched in the past um, with a bunch of different uh, academic literature, specifically through a lot of different institutions that have researched this in the past. I know uh, ASMI, Alabama um, is kind of one of these big pioneers in baseball biomechanics. Um, in the past, uh, Dr. Glenn Fleissig has really pushed a ton of research out. And then there's a ton of other places, um, universities. I don't want to go through and name a bunch and forget some. So th there's a ton of other universities uh, producing great research on baseball biomechanics. Another arm metric that is correlated with fastball velocity is shoulder horizontal abduction um, or their scap load. Um, and being able to time that up at foot plant, uh, a, a large scap load at foot plant is another big predictor of velocity. And I know we talked a little bit about the core and dissociating the pelvis from the back. How does that play a role in optimizing a pitching? Yeah, so being able to create that separation between the pelvis and the torso is kind of creating separation in the in their in their core. That separation. Um, allows for like a large gap in the angles between the pelvis and the torso. And that larger gap allows just more time and space for the torso and the arm to pick up speed as that gap gets closed. And ideally, you're going to want to create um, a large amount of separation and be able to close that gap quickly. And then going down to the legs and the lead leg and the lead knee and the hip working together, how does that play a role? And what are you using the force plates for? What are you looking for with that? Yeah, absolutely. So the force plates that we have, we have force plates embedded in our mound. Um, we're looking at the ground reaction force values um, in addition to kind of the kinematics from the motion capture system and tying those together. And the way I like to kind of think about the force plates is that's kind of creating the ceiling for how much create. If you're putting more force in the ground, it's creating um, a lot of uh, potential energy to be transferred up through the body. So we're going to want to see high force values, but we're also going to want to see like a large magnitude in those forces, as well as them directed and timed up properly. So on the back leg, we want to see that athlete producing a decent, a good amount of force vertically and towards home plate. Um, as they're working, kind of moving forward down the mound. But then uh, to get to your question on the lead leg side, um, we're going to want to see a large amount of vertical and um, posterior, so braking force um, on the front side. I uh, want to see that um, force vector kind of working back, stopping the stopping the linear move of the athlete down the mound and uh, transferring transferring that linear move into a rotational move. And so the lead leg, uh, ground reaction force values play a big part in that. And then how they move from there, the leg is important as well. Uh, how much they're able to kind of create a stable base on the front side and transfer energy up, up their body efficiently there. So creating a stable base on the front side and extending that lead knee um, prior to ball release are, are, are two big uh, things that we're looking at. Are you getting real-time data? Like, can a physical therapist or someone be with you and analyzing this data to provide biofeedback? So the pitcher, you notice that the force isn't as high as you would like it to be, and then you can do it again, and you can kind of analyze the numbers, or is this, like, feedback you're giving them afterwards? So this specific setup is, is not set up for uh, live feedback. Um, most motion capture systems aren't. I have, I have seen other products out there. Um, force plate mounts specifically that'll be able to give you force data um, a few seconds after, maybe five seconds after the pitch has happened. Um, we don't have that type of mound in here, so this is all after the fact. We'll we'll be able to see the video angles um, right away, but uh, this data kind of gets processed and and uh, in a short period of time, uh, we'll turn it around and get back with the athletes um, and kind of go through it after the fact. 
Yes, once you have all your data, you're doing your analyzing. How does that information get sent to the coaches, the strength coaches, athletic trainers, PTs, et cetera? What's your role in kind of divide or divvying out that information to figure out how to help the athlete get better? Yeah, so on the MedStar side of things, we're emailing out the report to the athlete and then kind of working with the physical therapist to kind of go through the the PT screen as well as the biomechanics report um, to see where things kind of add up and why an athlete might have the deficiencies that they do in the biomechanics report. So from there, we're going to kind of work together and figure out what is the root uh, potentially of these deficiencies and kind of go from there. If you're able to clean up and kind of attack a deficiency earlier on in the delivery, then ideally other things will kind of line up and clean up on their own. Um, and then uh, from there, we'll schedule a Zoom call and kind of go through this entire report uh, with the with the athlete. Um, if they have their own PT or pitching coach, uh, they'll be on and then we'll have me and then the the PT on the MedStar side as well to kind of go through uh, the PT screen and biomech report together, go through those reports separately, and then kind of how they tie together and why um, we might see some some deficiencies in the biomech report. And how often are you repeating these screens? So yeah, that, that's a great point. Ideally, we would like to we like to repeat these screens um, throughout the season, a few times throughout the season or throughout an off season, whatever the case is. It really on the level of the athlete what that timing looks like but yeah so having a baseline test we have an athlete come in get a baseline test and then make some suggestions and then we're going to look to get them retested throughout the course of the season or off season um, ideally give them enough time to kind of practice these new movement patterns and hopefully get them uh, more comfortable with these movement patterns and try to see them progress progress positively in their delivery, but looking at, I don't know, six to eight weeks um, as kind of a minimum, but yeah, looking, looking to get athletes in on the more of the scale of months, months later to come back into the lab and check things out. Um, some of these movement patterns are a little, uh, are a little bit more difficult to change, especially for an older athlete that has been doing the same thing for so many years. Um, so I'd like to give them a time to work on these changes and make them a little bit more natural before reassessing. I guess it's akin to concussion, like baseline testing. It's helpful to have a baseline. And then if they get hurt and you're doing a return to play protocol, you can look back and see when they were healthy, where they were at, and keep comparing that data until they get back to where they were or even better mechanically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that baseline is great. A great starting point, but then the retest and reevaluation and uh, keeping track of these trends over time is so valuable for an athlete that um, is either progressing in the right direction or maybe they're uh, struggling a little bit and we might want to get them back to what they were doing when they were performing well. So it works well in both in both scenarios. Can you tell me a little bit about the actual, I mean, I know you talked about the force plates a little bit and I've seen some cameras or some setups where they have the markers on the athlete, some don't. How does that all work? Yes. So yeah, there's marker-based motion capture and marker-less motion capture. Uh, I've worked with both in the past, um, specifically here in Bel Air um, at the Orioles MedStar Lab, we have a marker-less system. So the athletes do not have to put any markers on, but the the marker-based system is it's it's all very similar in the calculations of the data. Um, it's more of a difference in how the kind of model of the body is created. So with the marker based system, the cameras are seeing exactly where those markers are, where you stick them on the body and the marker list system, it's using um, their software that kind of stitches together all these camera angles and uses computer vision and machine learning and all these fancy uh, computer algorithms to basically determine where the where the body is in space based on all these different camera angles. Very cool. So with pitching, we're really with any sport, there is a certain style of the athlete. So there might be a general thing like pitching form that we would deem as like unique or beneficial or a good movement pattern. But some some athlete might have some crazy wind up and it works for them and they don't get hurt versus someone does it, I'm qu quoting correctly, and they do get hurt. So are there normative values of things that you're looking at? 
Yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's a great point for like the individual, the individuality of the athletes and how they move um, as well as kind of the balance between performance and injury risk. So yes, uh, to answer your question, we do have uh, reference values and kind of normative ranges. A lot of these are coming from uh, previous uh, research studies and academic literature that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's a lot of these kind of normative uh, values um, coming from those studies. And, and these values are uh, kind of predictive of velocity or predictive of um, injury risk. And so one athlete might be able to, as you're referring to earlier, one athlete might be able to kind of withstand a suboptimal delivery a little bit better. And on the side of performance, uh, it really is an interesting balance of sometimes those sub optimal or less efficient movement patterns create kind of outlier performance metrics where they're able to perform at a very high level doing something that is a little bit more unorthodox. So that is kind of an interesting balance in trying to figure out what is the right path to take uh, with an athlete. Because sometimes if you create more efficiency um, in their delivery, it's going to take away their competitive advantage in their delivery. So yeah, definitely. It's definitely interesting working with whether it's a physical therapist, pitching coach, whoever it might be, um, about striking that balance and figuring out um, where that athlete is. And that can kind of depend on where the athlete is in their career. Um, if they're younger and they're trying to, you know, play at play at a higher level um, and stay healthy while they're doing it, it might be they might take a different route than a guy who is maybe a professional athlete, kind of. Uh, towards the end of his career or has been kind of struggling a little bit might be a little bit more less risk averse I guess in his changes if that makes sense it it does and I think it's a nice reflection showing the importance of the collaboration between you and all the team members because if you just look at the data and just go by that but you don't take into account the individualized person in front of you and what their unique anatomy is and how they move best then you could really like you said, make something more less optimal for the athlete if you say give them too much rotation in a certain direction or you try to adjust something that was working for them. So that that importance of collaborating and going over the numbers, but also taking into account just understanding movement patterns from our point of view versus camera's point of view. Yeah, exactly. That context is context is massively important and super helpful. Um if we're gonna try to attack um something some change in their delivery but within the in the pt screen or the functional movement assessment it's not something that they have the mobility range of motion or stability to be able to do to get into those positions and then that's we're really going to be banging our heads against the wall trying to make that change in their delivery when it's something that they really struggle at so yeah the context is huge in really tying everything together and uh, streamlining that player's uh, development process. I don't know if the, this is a too personal of a question. I don't want you to give your your tricks away or your ideas away, but in an ideal world, if you could do a research study or use the information that you're you're gleaning in order to optimize pitching mechanics and help athletes get better, what would you look at or what are you curious about? Yeah, so I can tell you a little bit about um, my master's thesis project at Wake Forest because um, it's kind of along that topic. So um, definitely interested. I'm personally interested in the integration between um, strength and conditioning and kind of training um, sports specifically to kind of increase performance on the mound and the translation of training to in-game performance. So for my master's, I looked at uh, medicine ball exercises, rotational medicine ball exercises, and how the kinematics and kinetics of those rotational medicine ball exercises compared to uh, those those same pitchers um, compared to their pitching uh, motion. So we did I did motion capture evaluations on uh, two different medicine ball exercises, kind of a, a rotational push on the athletes holding the ball in between their hips and their shoulder on their on their throwing side, and then they move down the mound and just push the medicine ball forward, almost like a shot put forward. 
Um, and then the second medicine ball exercise was kind of an overhead chop, starting the medicine ball in the same position, but kind of swinging it behind them over their head and slamming it down in front of them. So the first one being more of a kind of a horizontal rotational exercise and the second one being vertical over the top vertical um, rotational plane exercise and then comparing that to their throwing mechanics. So looking to see if one of these two would be more optimal for training for training pitchers, whether it's force production through the force plates or movement patterns in general, how they use their lower body to set up their delivery um, or how they rotate their lower body and trunk um, and stuff like that. So definitely interested in the kind of connection between the training world and then the the world of competition on the field. What did you find in your research study? Yeah, so I found that um, the two different medicine ball exercises were actually beneficial. They were both beneficial, but for different for different reasons. So uh, the the first one that described the rotational exercise, uh, the rotational throw that was more of a shot put, um, or the medicine ball push, was uh, a little bit better for the lead leg. It helped the athlete produce more force on their lead leg, and uh, they're able to lead leg block a little bit better. Uh, using that exercise um, and then for the chop exercise they're actually able to generate more on their on their drive leg on their back leg so a little bit one was a little bit more lead leg focused one was a little bit more um, drive leg focused and then from there you can kind of look at what the athlete does in their pitching delivery and see what they might need if they need work on the drive leg then maybe they kind of lean more towards that overhead chop uh, medicine ball exercise and vice versa for the lead leg and the medicine ball the push exercise yeah i know i'm picking your brain about this study but i'm very curious how did you determine the weight of the medicine ball and like reps sets how many times a week were they doing this program and for how long yeah so i i collaborated with the wake forest baseball uh, strength conditioning coach and he had uh, multiple different exercises medicine ball exercises built into the um, baseball teams programming. And so I worked with him and uh, I chose two exercises that were already kind of built into his programming that the athletes were already doing on a regular basis um, throughout their training. And I picked two exercises that were um, pretty different from each other because I wanted to see um, which one I wanted to see the differences between these two, I guess, extremes um, mm -hmm. in the in the medicine ball exercise world. And then um, yeah, collaborated with him and he, he kind of helped me come to the conclusion of which exercises to use. Cause there's a lot of them that are just slight variations on each other. And these ones were different enough, also very commonly programmed in his training. So that's how he kind of came to the, uh, the decision of those medicine ball exercises. How long of a period were they doing this consistently for the study? So this study was actually cross-sectional. So we just did, okay. um, just did these collections on on uh, one day they did their medicine ball exercises and then the next time they came up for their bullpen um, they they threw so it was a lot of them were on the same day they did their medicine ball exercises um, on the motion capture and then they threw their bullpen right after um, but they were doing these exercises and these training programs throughout the entirety of their fall season and okay. then I collected data at the end of their fall season so they had been doing these um, exercises for for months prior sure. I'm, I'm done picking your brain about your <laughs> your <laughs> masters yeah no um, problem. is there anything else that you would like physical therapists to know about what you do or how we can collaborate if there's an athlete that is interested in getting this done how would they go about doing so yeah so i mean i just would like to emphasize the um in my opinion, the importance of the collaboration between uh, different departments on this, um, on these motion capture studies, that's going to provide a ton of uh, very helpful context and you get different uh, professionals working from different uh, points of view and are going to have different areas of expertise. And if you get all these inputs on the same athlete coming from different directions, um, you're going to see where the where the overlap is in them. And that's really where you're going to see um, kind of the biggest gains and biggest uh, performance gains and ideally uh, injury risk reduction kind of paired together. So yeah, the 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 collaboration between departments is 
very important. And yeah, I just love bouncing ideas off of whether it's the PT, the strength coach, the pitching coach, um, to see what their thoughts are and how the different, um, how the different professionals might kind of attack the same problem. It's, it's interesting to see like where they, where they are the same, where they, where they, um, agree on things and how they attack the same problem differently, um, is, is cool to see, which, which helps the athlete as well. If, um, they're trying to attack a certain deficiency and kind of get better at this one movement pattern, um, having different, um, exercises and different ways to do it helps it from getting stale and helps them from, it helps them kind of get that movement pattern ingrained, um, all in, in different environments as well. I really appreciate that you call it injury risk reduction and not injury prevention. I have to say that. I know some people think it's semantics, but I think it's important and I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's tough. Unfortunately, it's not, um, a direct correlation between, um, injury and, uh, kind of what we see in the motion capture lab. You actually brought up concussions earlier. I think that's a pretty great um, parallel to kind of arm injuries in baseball where there's no specific threshold for once you reach this velocity or once you reach this value on your motion capture report, you're going to get hurt. Um, similarly in concussions, some athletes can withstand a larger hit in football and not get a concussion, whereas some athletes, just the way things work out, are able, they get injured um, with lower lower forces, lower torques on their arm, or kind of lower impacts in the concussion world. So I think that's a good parallel for arm injuries um, in baseball. Awesome. Joey, I like to end our podcast with favorite quotes. So I want to know a quote or two or three that moves you, inspires you, drives you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you get heads up on this. And I've been thinking, and I couldn't decide. I have three quotes. They're all short, um, but I have three quotes. Um, Number one, how long are you going to wait before you demand the best for yourself? Uh, that's from Epictetus. Um, number two, we cannot all do great things, but we can do small things with great love. That is Mother Teresa. And number three, I'm not sure who this one's attributed to, but I've heard it um, kind of just in popular culture. Um, but I, I like this one as well. If you want to live a meaningful life, then everything you do matters. Those love are, those it. Those are my three quotes. I love it. Honestly, no one ever turns this question back to me, but I think if someone had to ask me a favorite quote, I there's no way I can narrow it down to one. So I appreciate <laughs> you sharing all three with us. Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. Joey, where can people find you? Um, yeah, people can find me on social media. I'm not very active on social media, but I'm out there. It's at Joey Mylot, at J O E Y M Y L O T T on Instagram. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I'm not super active, so hopefully I respond, but if there are athletes that want to do this screen, is there a way to connect with you? Where do they go in order to, to get that done? Yes. Yeah, so there is a page on the MedStar website. I believe it's, um, medstarhealth.org slash pitching lab. Okay. Um, I can link it in the show notes. Yeah. So th there's a pitching lab, uh, page on the Webster on the MedStar website. Um, okay. And that is is the best way to kind of go through to get this process started to come into the lab um, in Bel Air. Great. Joey, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this and talk to me about biomechanics. I love talking about it. There we go. Awesome. All right. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Let's Get Physical Therapy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram at MedStarHealthPT. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so we can reach more listeners just like you. As always, we appreciate your time and hope you join us for our next episode.